start with the distillation question. And the main thing I want to talk about here is just a little bit about the process of testing and training and how do you evaluate outliers and assess outliers. So how many of you decided to do the distillation question at this time? Have, have any of you looked at it? Yeah, okay, so I'm not going to go through the background here. Maybe just, um, I'm going to read in the data set, the plot it. Uh, so you get the QQ plot, and that's, that's pretty much what it looks like. Um, so there's tails on, on, the low, on the lower end, the residuals are, are not quite normally distributed, although it's definitely not bad. Most real data sets show very, very strong non-normality. This is pretty good. It's just this tiny kind of area out here that that seems a little bit unusual. Um, the rest of the residuals are just fine. And um, calculating this, the standard error I gave in the part five of the tutorial, I gave the formula. So what this does here is it says take the module. Uh, linear model where we regress vapor pressure onto temperature, extract the residuals from those, square them, calculate the sum, and divide through by the degrees of freedom. So model dollar per residual is a sub variable of model which is calculated by the volume function. So DF of residual just is a shortcut so that you don't have to write the N minus K. Because remember the standard area that you divide through by N minus K. So instead of counting up what N is and counting what K is, uh, you can just use this variable, which is pretty good to do that. And in this case, the standard error comes up to 2.9. So roughly 3. So we're measuring our y variable here is in, in kPa, kilopascals. So this is telling us that an approximate standard deviation for these errors is 3 kPa. Um, and then, do I still have the QT part up? I'll just quickly show you here. If the, no. Um, the reason why I'm saying that is, okay, so the standard error is plus or minus 3 kPa, but the y variable moves in the region of, my, of 25 up to 60. So the y variable has a range of, say, about 30 units of kPa, 35 units of kPa, and your standard error is 3 of those, so about 10% of your data is not explainable or standard. So this is good, a good judge of how big is that standard error. Okay, so when it comes to testing and training, the tutorial shows one way to do it. What I've done here is I say uh, build is equal to an index vector. So it's a vector that just goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 59. It's a sequence vector. That's going to be the first 15, 159 samples to build our model. Then sequence 160 up to n, uh, n being in this case the length of all the number of observations we have. That's going to be our testing vector. So we're using the first 159 observations to build our model, and then the, the, the remainder of the observations to test our model. And that coincides with um, the reason why it's 159 is because the data from 2000 to 2001 uh, ends at, at sample 159. So the data from 2002 is 160 onwards. So we say linear model, and then it's quite interesting. This time we don't say with what the y and the x variables are. We just say build a linear model from this existing variable called the model. The model is the previous model that we find here. So R already knows that model is a linear v squares model where vapor pressure is being regressed onto temperature. So it knows that and it extracts that information from model. But then there's this new option that we give to LN, subset equals build. So that tells R which subset of the data originally defined when you define model. To use. So when model was originally defined, it used all the data. We just used the whole vapor pressure vector and the complete temperature vector. So when we come down here, R, R gets that back and then only takes the first 159 subset of those samples. And it rebuilds the model for you and I've assigned it the variable name model.sub. So that subset model 
uh, it can then be summarized and you can do a huge plot for that and Calpex and here. Yeah, so I'm just going to execute the code up to that point. Um, and So the standard error up to that point is 2.67. So it's comparable, it's slightly smaller than what we had before. When we just used the data from 2000 and 2001. So we get a very similar standard error. Then what I take here now in the next section is I create a prediction set. So I, I, in, the, in the part five of the tutorial, I show quite a few steps of how to build a prediction set. What you have to do is you have to use this data frame variable, oh, sorry, data frame uh, command. And what it does is it takes in various options. So it says temp C2. So it's going to create a data frame or a data set object where one of your columns is called temp C2. And the data for that column comes from this variable temp C2, but it's only going to take the testing subset. So this will create a new data variable for you in the R workspace where the column name is temp C2 and the data comes from this variable temp C2. The reason why I'm kind of emphasizing that point is that when R uses this data frame in the model in the next step, when I use it on the predict function, it's going to look for a variable called temp C2 because when this model was built originally, it was defined as vapor pressure as the y variable and temp C2 is the x variable. If I had called this ABC, for example, then down here, when I build this data frame, I have to use that ABC is that it, whatever the data is. So those names, it's just the column names of the variables have to match up. Um, that's, that's why this kind of seems a little weird to say temp C2 equals temp C2, but it's for that reason. Okay, so uh, let me just perhaps show you here x.new run this. So what x.new looks like is there's a column name, temp C2, and then the remainder of the observations, 94 observations in this case. Then I take those, that variable x.new, and I give it to this function called predict. So predict is another generic function in R which will take a model and get a new data set and build a prediction set for you. So this is much easier than extracting from model what the, what the slope coefficient is, what the intercept is, and, and writing out b0 plus b1 times x nu. Rather than the predict function which just tech, which will extract the correct coefficients out of model, of model of sub in this case, give it the new x variables, and then gives you a new y hat. Okay, so once we have the new predictions of y hat, you want to figure out, well, how good are they? In this case, we have the original x data, the, x, the actual measurements of vapor pressure. So that vapor pressure square <coughs> brackets test gives you just the 94 testing observations from the vapor pressure vector. And I call that y dot actual. And so the errors then is the difference between the two. And if you plot those errors, you can see just for the 94 observations, so up to 94, errors should be centered around zero, and they are probably not too centered in this case, which indi indicates there's some offset in, the, in this prediction. Uh, this model isn't working quite as well for the testing data set as it did for when it was built. Because look, there's a consistent under prediction. Uh, so y minus y hat is equal to error. So B is equal to y minus y hat. That's what we're plotting here on the y-axis. So the fact that this is less than zero indicates we're always uh, subtracting a bigger number. So actually, sorry, it's an over-prediction. We're always predicting a bigger y than the actual y. So we're over-predicting what our vapor pressure is in that column on average, given that the majority of these residuals are below zero. Furthermore, there also seems to be some time varying trend in that uh, residual method. So we may not be quite satisfying the assumptions of independence data. So these are just some cautions to be aware of as you use the model. Um, lastly, I can also calculate the standard error from, um, 
I don't want to calculate standard, I want to calculate R and SCP. So root mean squared error of prediction was uh, the quantity of the square root um, of the mean of all the errors squared. So since I've got the errors computed on the testing data, I can calculate R and SCP. And what I want to do is contrast that to the standard error. Um, so R and SCP in this case is four units. And then the standard error is 2.6. So it's showing you, again, the standard deviation of your prediction errors is, is larger than what the model uh, was when it was built. And that's, that's common. You'll always see that for any true data system, any model, whether it's least squares, neural networks, uh, multivariate data analysis models, your prediction error is usually larger than what it was when you trained it. When you trained it or built your model, um, if you get it the other way around, it's pure luck. But usually, your prediction error is always higher um, on totally new data, just because the model never knew about this future data when it was built. Um, okay, and then when it comes to influential data points, let's just take a look here and talk a bit about this plot. A few people had some questions about it. What's going on here is uh, that influence plot we spoke about at the end of the class. This is a very uh, detailed plot in terms of the quantity of information it carries. So this is being shown here for the testing data set, the training data set. On the x-axis, it shows the leverage. So the hat value is the, is the leverage. It's of how far away that observation was from the center of the model when it was built. Uh, so when we built it, uh, and in this case there's a negative relationship. So here's x bar over here, the mean of the model. So points with high hat values are far away from the model center, They're either towards the left or to the right uh, of the model. And hat values also Recall those, if they start to move around, if, this, if these data points kind of move up, they pull the slope up towards it, so they have some influence on that slope. So that's what the meaning of a hat value is. On the y-axis, we have the standardized uh, student-type residuals. And I don't think I mentioned this in the last class, but, um, or in case I did, I'll just repeat it. What happens is the student-type residuals, the way you can interpret them is it's, it's like an ordinary residual but you divide it through by the standard error that's computed in a, in a particular way. And what that does is it normalizes the residuals. Because for this system, you saw the residuals can be, say, plus or minus 6. On another system, the residuals can be minus, plus or minus 20, depending on the y variable and the units of it. So by standardizing the residuals, we can kind of pull them onto an equal footing so you can compare them. And student size residuals the name is descriptive it is because those residuals are distributed according to the t-distribution. And the reason why the cutoffs are shown at plus and minus 2 is for the t-distribution, it's centered at 0. Remember the critical value over here and over here of plus and minus 2 spans roughly 95% of the area under the t-distribution. So the plus and minus 2 cutoffs should span on ordinary data about 95% of your variance. Uh, sorry, 95% of the data points. So points beyond those limits are large residuals. They're the probability of obtaining a residual to that uh, on the lower end beyond minus 2 or above plus 2 is relatively small. So the fact that you're seeing a data point out there uh, indicates it's, there's some degree of unusual Then the third aspect that's been problem in this, this graph is the the size of the circles are proportional to Cook's D. And Cook's D we, we derived last time as the product of, of um, leverage and of discrepancy. So larger diameter circles are more troublesome. They're going to influence the model to a greater extent than circles with smaller diameter. So given that as background, let's take a look at what this plot means. It means that point 38 up here has a large positive residual, so it's underpredicted by the model. Um, secondly, it's got a high leverage value, the highest in the data set. And then thirdly, it's got the largest Cook's D. And that's expected because Cook's D is a product of 
the quantity shown on the y-axis and the x-axis. So Cook's T is a product of leverage and of discrepancy. We're showing leverage on the x-axis and discrepancy on the y. So the circles are kind of proportional to the deviation of um, uh, parities on the x and y axis as well. So 38 is definitely influence, influencing the model to some extent. So are 84, 53, and 101. Uh, these are points with high hat values. There, this, is, this vertical line is the second uh, two times the average hat value, and then the other vertical line is three times the average hat value. So we've got points at um, 2 and 3 h bar. Uh, points, I kind of see 2 h bar as, a, as my warning limits and 3 h bar as my action limits, if you want to use that terminology. So those four points to the to this side of it, um, to the right of this vertical line, are troublesome. This point isn't. This tiny point over here. It's got a small uh, Cook's T. It's got a low residual size, low student-type residual, so it's not very influential on the model. I'm not going to worry about that one. Uh, so. So those are the first four uh, observations I would target and try and understand why they, why they were um, outliers. And before I just delete them, I would go back to my raw data, go back to the time frame when they occurred, and try to see what was going on in the plant at that time. If you just delete them, sure, you're going to get maybe an improved model, but you're not going to learn anything more. The idea is that you first try to understand a bit more about what caused those problems at that time before you just remove them from the model. But given that this isn't really your data set, it's harder, harder to do that. And, uh, and there's also about 50 columns in this data set that are not very well labeled. So it's really tough for you to go and investigate every point here. But that is the approach you would take in practice. Okay. Um, any questions up to this point? Just on the interpretations and stuff. Okay. Uh, then we go and remove these uh, points. And the way you do that in R is to specify this remove vector, which gives the indices of those, ver uh, of those observations you'd like to remove. And again, we're going to use this idea where we say linear model, and we tell it which model to use. And we're going to use the built vector. and the build vector, remember, is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 59. And then square brackets remove says, and deleting those four observations. So uh, those four observations will be missing from the build vector. Then we uh, rebuild that model. I've called it model of update, summary, QT plot, standard error. And you can go repeat the influence plot after that point. Um, and now you get some more outlines. And you can go repeat and repeat and, and do this. There will always be a few outliers that, that uh, keep coming up. But you see, this is the third hat value. I, I would be inclined to kind of stop here. Um, I wouldn't go and remove 39, 25, 41, and those others up there. They've got low, low hat values. Removing them is not going to change the slope by very much. Um, they've got low leverage. All that they are is they're points with large residual size, and that's why the Cook's D is large and the circle is being colored in red. Remember, the Cook's D cutoff is uh, 4 divided by n minus k. Um, so those points have got diameter larger than that cutoff size, and then being colored in red. That's, in fact, when um, you plot this model, influence by plot, and you say identify equals auto, that's the way it's identifying which circles to color red and which black. It just colors anything that's above that point with red. Uh, it's not got some clever algorithm to go figure out if there are outliers or not. It's just using Cook's D to color the circles. So I wouldn't go remove that. And neither would I remove point 39. It's got very low leverage. So deleting it and refilting the model is not going to improve it in any way. All that's going to happen is that by deleting them, your R squared is going to improve because all that R squared is is a measure of fit. But it's pretty meaningless to just go delete and, and try to improve R squared. What we want to be concerned with is the fact that we're not unduly biasing the model. We're not going to get a slope that's different to what it should be. 
Um, that's what I'm more concerned about. Is, is, is putting a slope that's incorrect, that would be a problem. But these points, as they stand there, would not influence the slope by very much if we go remove them and rebuild. Okay? And then, um, then again, you can go and, and build the predictions and calculate the R and SCP on this updated model. So the updated model was here with just removing those four observations. Um, so rebuilding that and calculating standard error. So R and SCP has come down now. It goes four point something. Um, yeah, it goes 4.1. Uh, when we kept those four observations in, and by deleting the four observations out, the root and square error has dropped up to 2.9. And the standard error of the, of the model itself has dropped to 2.45. So, okay, so that's the kind of thinking I want you to use when you answer these questions and when you analyze your own data sets, is you really have to think about what you're doing, why you're deleting outliers, and for what reason. So that's why I wanted to just go through a bit of that. Then the other question is the bioreactor question. Uh, this is question six. Let's just take a look at that. Um, <coughs> show that here. So the bioreactor data looks something like that, where we've got the temperature, duration of the batch, the speed of the, um, the pellet, presumably, and whether the bioreactor had baffles in or not. And the outcome from all of this is the yield. So the first question asks a uh, further linear model to use these x variables to predict yield. So this is the first time in R that you now go to building multiple x vectors into your model. And the way to do it is simple. You just say regress yield onto baffles plus speed plus temperature plus duration. And it will build a model with those four x variables. Summarize it here. <coughs> so the summary is like any other linear model summary. You've got your estimated coefficient, sorry, the estimated intercept. The estimated coefficient for baffles, yes. So baffles is coded as, um, so if we had to go D for baffles and then DI. So DI would be equal to zero for no baffle and DI would be equal to one for uh, baffles present. So the interpretation of the baffles, yes, being minus nine is by adding baffles to your bioreactor, it serves to decrease the yield by nine percent, keeping all the other variables constant. So the addition of battles decreases your yield. Speed, on the other hand, is a small addition. But then again, speed value itself is in the order of 4,000, 5,000. So uh, it may still be a significant effect. We can't really tell just by looking at the size of the coefficient. That's not going to help us. Uh, so yeah, don't be confused by saying, well, battles is a far more influential effect on speed. Because no, battles units are very, uh, go from 0 to 1 where speed goes 4,000 to 5,000. So you have to kind of think of the product of the effect. Then temperature, an increase of one degree Fahrenheit, I think, or Celsius, whatever it is in this case, has a decrease on yield of 0.47. Now, the confidence intervals for those, uh, you just use the confidence function, and you just check whether they span zero to decide whether there's a significant effect. So in this case, confidence all of the, all of the uh, coefficients are significant. This is both negative, these are both positive, these are both negative. The duration is NA. Um, we'll talk a bit about that in a second. Um, I'm not going to go too much to the plots, the influence plot, but I'm going to talk now about the x matrix here. And a few people have asked, you know, asked me, I can't get this thing to work. What's going on here? I'm getting NA, so it's getting singular matrices. The reason why I showed the plots here is, let's take a look at what's going on in the system. Okay? So we've got the way to read this plot, for those of you who haven't seen the scatter plot matrices, are there's these five variables in the matrix. 
temperature duration speed back into the middle. So in the first row, temperature is shown on the y-axis, and then the x-axis is duration speed battles and yield respectively of those plots. So my pointer is gone. Uh, so you've got temperature on the y-axis here, and then duration on the x-axis. On this plot, we've got speed on the x-axis, battles on the x-axis, so it's either zero, oh, it's one or two, um, and then yield is varies between 30 and 60. So you can see the effect of temperature then is to decrease yield. And that makes, that gels with the coefficient that we saw early on in the linear model. What is the effect of duration on yield? No effect, right? There's no variance in that variable. But you can't, there may be an effect on yield. It's just that these uh, few data points we've taken, there is no variability in duration to, to tell what its effect is on yield. Um, it might be that if you ran the reactor for twice as long as the yield would be lower or higher. But just given this data set, we can't tell. Um, there's no variance in that, in that variable. Speed's effect, um, you can see that so speed is here on the uh, x-axis. 300,500 up to 4,500. There seems to be somewhat of a speed effect, although small. How, how would you read this part for baffles in here? What's your interpretation of the effect between baffles and here? Right, so, and what does it, how does the effect of baffles change yield? Sorry? No, no, what does baffles, if, what is the presence or absence of the baffle do to the yield that you get from the, from the batch? We'll take a look at this, uh, this plot is this, the, just a flipped um, plot. So baffles is here at the, at the low end. There's no baffle, and this is the baffle is present. So the effect of baffles is to decrease the yield. And we saw that with the coefficient, but we're just verifying that here in the plot. Thinking the assignments are hard to show that with a box plot, which makes more is a, is a more natural way of showing that. But when you throw up a scatter plot matrix, it's just going to always use uh, scatter plots to do that. So you have to be able to still interpret what integer variables look like. Okay, um, so why does this X matrix crash when you try to calculate X transpose X inverse? Well, so the X matrix multiplied by um, so B intercept, uh, B duration, uh, B, which are the other variables? Was right at the top. Okay, so okay, so what's the first column in the X matrix? So you can do so X is multiplied by this B matrix to give Y. So what is your first column look like in X? Many observations there are, right? So 
of this 20 observations, there'll be 20 rows of x. The reason is one is you multiply one by the, the intercept term. Well, okay, so there's a lot of land faces. <laughs> let's explain this. Uh, anyway, let's just step back and look at the model. The building model of the form y is the intercept plus, um, let's just get the same duration. So the model that, we, that R is going to build for us and that we're going to help with is our Y, our field, is a function of the intercept term, the duration coefficient times the actual duration, speed times speed, baffle coefficient times baffle, and this is, a, this is our zero one variable, so this speed it turns on or off, and then V temperature times X temperature. So that's our general equation. We write this out for each of the observations in the data set. So, for example, the first one, tech the yield is 51. So, our y, call, our y is going to have a 51 there. V intercept, which we don't know. V duration times x duration, which is 260. Then speed, which is 4,300 in the first row. The baffles was uh, no baffles in the first row, so that's a zero plus x temperature, which was 82 degrees Celsius. So that's the first row. Then you repeat that for the second row, third row, fourth row. And you build up in matrix form this. So it's more convenient to write this in matrix form, where x multiplied by those unknown coefficients gives you y. So y would be. Um, I'll just write it out here, so it's 51, 30, 40, and so on, up to 38. So that's what our known y is. So we need to say v intercept plus something times v duration. In this case, v duration times the x variable duration is 260. Then the variable for speed is 4,300. Then baffles is yes, no, so that's a, a zero because the first observation baffles were not used. And then the temperature was 82. So that would be the first row in the X matrix. Okay? The second row would go the same. We would just copy uh, the data from this table. So the second row was done in a lower speed. The baffles were used for that particular run and then the temperature was 90 degrees. Yeah. Why do you have all the intercepts of one? How do you determine? Okay, good question. So, coming back to this equation here, y is equal to v intercept plus v duration times x duration and so on. So, in order to get v intercept in there, it's an unknown, we're going to estimate that. So it goes there as a first position, so it needs a one as a coefficient. Like on the assignment, we had like a problem where we had to predict the linear model, and then we got the intercept from that. So are we predicting more than that intercept? Okay, that's right. Yeah. So when we're using this form of it, you're going to build this x matrix, and you've got this y vector over here, and then you calculate the prediction coefficients yourself by hand. When you say uh, the estimated is x transpose x inverted times x transpose y. So what we're doing is just building up the x matrix and the y vector. Then we can plug this into MATLAB or R or whatever you prefer and calculate v hat, which is what R does for you. But the re uh, this question asks to do it by hand. Okay. So the third row then, uh, we can go and copy that in. And then the last row would be 260. In fact, all of those are 260 in that column. 
This was done at a different speed, 4,100. That will be used, and the, and the temperature was done too. And the yield is still there. OK, so now you see the problem with the x matrix. When you calculate x transpose x, and then you try to invert it, what, what will happen? Well, firstly, what do you notice about the first two columns in X? Sorry? They're both constant, right? So we would use a terminology that they're collinear. There's the same relationship between the first two columns in X. When you take two collinear columns, you calculate X transpose X and you try to invert that, the determinant of X transpose X uh, so you can check the determinant of x transpose x will be approximately zero. Or we use the terminology that the matrix is singular. So you cannot invert x transpose x. Okay. So how R, R still spits out an answer for you. I mean, we saw that there earlier. But it puts N8 for the coefficient for duration. R just says that's N8. Because it just it can't estimate that. What R does is it, it sees that it's collinear with this column, and it drops out this and calculates x transpose x behind the scenes and gives you an answer still. But this is the reason why you, you see those NAs in the output is that the first two columns are identical with each other. In fact, if you maybe fit a model without the intercept, okay, so if you fit a model where y hat was just equal to d duration uh, times x duration. Uh, if you just dropped out this term, so in other words, you remove that column of ones from the x matrix. Now what happens? Can you invert x transpose x now? If you drop out that first column of ones. So if you remove this column out here, we've removed the collinearity. And we can invert x transpose x now. But then you don't have an intercept term. And in fact, you would then confound, or, or basically what's happening is that we're going to estimate over here the intercept that would have been estimated is going to be put into here as a combination like this. You're going to be estimating t. Because this is our column of once. So the coefficient you'll estimate then is really not the effective duration, but you're going to be estimating the combined effect. Because those two variables move up and down exactly the same way, the intercept term and the duration term move together. So you cannot separately estimate the effect. You're just going to be estimating the combined effect. So you can't even trick it that way. Think, OK, I'm going to be smart to do that column. Because you'll get it. Still, you won't get the correct interpretation. OK, so I see a lot of confused faces. Just think a bit. The reason why I put this question in there is for, to think a bit about what you're doing with your data. Don't just plug it into R and get your coefficients and then interpret them. Think a bit about what's going on. If you have a data set with a constant column, you just cannot do anything with it. There's no way you can build a model from that constant. There's no variance. Um, in, in the earlier class, remember we showed that V1 was something like, um, back, back to the linear case, V1 was a function of some numerator term, which I don't remember off my head, but it was x minus x bar, the sum of x minus x bar squared in a denominator term. Okay? For a column of x's where there's no variability in x, x minus x bar is 0 every time. So your end divided through by zeros, and that's why the V1, or in this case V duration term, blows up, because you're dividing through by a zero. Um, so I put that in there. The sensible solution for question six is to say, I can't do anything with the duration variable. You just drop it out and you work with the rest of the data. Um, so before you just plug plug stuff into your R and let it go and compute, just take a look at it and think a bit about what you're doing. That's the intention of the question. Okay?